Good morning again. Wow. That's weak. Good morning again. That's much better. We're going through some of the events that happened in the Old Testament. And, you know, maybe you haven't been following Christ for, for very long. And uh, uh, you may not know some of these stories that we've been talking about going through in the Old Testament. And you know what? That's okay. There was a time I didn't know these stories. And there was a time that everyone in this room didn't have a clue about any of these stories that we've been going through. That's okay, because you can learn about them right here, right now, and you can learn from them. For many of you, these stories are old news. You've heard it all before, but you know what? You can still learn from them, and you can still apply these principles of these Old Testament stories to your life. God said that his word is living and active. It's the living word of God. He's speaking to us constantly. He's teaching us constantly. And I can read John 3.16 one day and get one thing from it. And I can read John 3.16 the next week and get something completely different from it. And then a month later, read it again and get something totally different from it again. His word is living and, <coughs> and active. We can always learn from this. So, every time we discuss the Bible, God has something to teach you. Every time. If you open the book, there's something in there just for you. All right, so we left, last left Moses on this side of the Red Sea. God parted the waters and his people walked through on dry land. And then Pharaoh's army took off after them. And then what happened? Sea collapsed on Pharaoh's army, right? Pharaoh's army did the dead man's float. They, he wiped them out. So, so God uh, got the glory and it was all God. It's all about God. He was fighting this battle before the, the uh, Israelites even knew that he was fighting it. God was fighting it the whole time. So now we're going to fast forward for the next 40 years. God's people wandered around in the desert. Now, there's a lot of neat lessons you can learn from that, and you probably want to go back and read about all of that. But we're going to skip forward. That's where uh, Moses got the Ten Commandments while they were wandering around in the, in the desert. And, and when Moses got the Ten Commandments, the, the Hebrews were, that they weren't ready to go into the promised land yet. They didn't know completely how to trust God. They didn't know how to follow God. And God had many lessons for them uh, over those, those 40 years. They were learning. They were, God was getting them ready to go into the promised land. And now Moses has died. And God has put Joshua in charge of his people. And we're going to see today that Joshua didn't fight the battle of Jericho Contrary to that popular song. You know the song, right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. You know the song I'm talking about, right? Great song. Awesome song. Not true. Joshua didn't fight the battle of Jericho. God did. And, and we're going to see all of that. We're going to see that they crossed over the Jordan River and they came uh, uh, in, into the promised land and they walked up to this fortified city called Jericho. And they took that city but it was God that did it. It was all about God. As we discuss this today, I don't want you to miss the personal spiritual application. You should ask yourself, even before we start, what is my personal Jericho today? What is the obstacle? What is it in my life that's keeping me from entering into all that God has promised me. Maybe it's a, a thought pattern that you go through in your mind. Maybe it's a, a temperament that you have, a personality characteristic. 
What obstacle is keeping you from God's plan, from God's best in your life? As we discuss the fall of Jericho, be thinking about how you can apply this to your personal life and how your personal Jericho can fall. We're not going to read the whole thing right now. Uh, we'll, we'll read as we go along. But let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, as we look at your word this morning, God, I pray that you would teach us. Teach us the truth about ourselves. Reveal to us the truth about you and about faith and what it takes for us to follow you in faith. Father, if there's anyone in this room that has not yet trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, we pray that today would be that day. God, many of us in this room are fighting battles that nobody even knows about. And I pray that today would be a breakthrough day where the walls of our Jerichos come tumbling down. Reveal our sin to us. And help us to leave this place different than we were when we walked in. In all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, so as we lead up to the battle of Jericho, we're going to get a running start at it to see how God prepared the people for this amazing miracle. I want to tell you this right up front. God has been preparing you for what he is going to do in your life Today, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. All your life, he's been preparing you for it, just like he did the Israelites as they wandered in the desert for 40 years, and even now as they get ready to cross the Jordan. Turning your Bible to Joshua chapter 3. It's right after Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Joshua chapter 3. And I'm going to read 5 through 16 right quick. Joshua 3, 5 through 16. Then Joshua said to the people, remember now Moses is dead, right? Joshua is the leader here now. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant, and they went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan." And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. <coughs> and when the soles of the feet of the priest bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark and the, of, of the covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zerathan. And those flowing downward 
toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over opposite of Jericho. Man, this kind of reminds you of, of uh, the Red Sea, of how, how the waters parted and piled up on each side. Well, now God's doing it again. Why has he got to do this again? Because this is a whole new generation of people. Moses and his generation had died off. And now, now we got a whole new generation that has heard all about the Red Sea, but they didn't see it, nor did they remember experiencing it. Moses was gone. The old generation is gone. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, and most of them are gone except for Caleb and Joshua. And here we have God demonstrating his power to a brand new people. Here's a faith lesson. This is what you need to be writing down. The faith lesson. In faith, you have to move forward with God's commands in order to see the miracle. God told the priest, he said, go stand in the river. Let me say that again in case you didn't get it all. In faith, you have to move forward with God's plans, God's commands, in order to see the miracle. Now, he told the priest, go stand in the river. A ridiculous thing to do when the river is at flood stage. You know what's going to happen? You go stand in a river at flood stage, you're going to get swept downstream, right? You're going to die. You're going to drown. Either that or the Israeli EMT group's going to have to come out and rescue you, one or the other. But that's not going to happen. They didn't have an EMT. They didn't have an ambulance. They didn't have people trained for that. I want you to notice when the river stopped flowing. As soon as their feet touched the water. That's when the river quit flowing. That's when it stopped. God told them what to do, and the miracle didn't happen until they obeyed God's command. Now, our problem is we would have got right up to the bank of the river and stood on the dry ground and said, okay, God, you stop this water, and I'll step out there. Okay? I'm no fool. My mama raised one fool. That's my brother. I, you, you got these waters here? I'm not stepping in that. I'm not going to do it. You stop the water, I'll step on in, God. You do the miracle, then I'll follow your command. That sounds just like us, doesn't it? That's what we expect. That's all we expect. But that is not how faith operates. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We say, seeing is believing. God says, faith is believing even before you see, because he said so. In faith, you have to move forward with God's commands in order to see the miracle. Somebody say amen. See, y'all have to start giving me feedback here. Say some amens and stuff. Y'all are dead. Y'all need to wake up because if you say amen or that's right or something like that to a preacher, that's like saying sick them to a bulldog, okay? So somebody say amen. Somebody say that's right. Somebody say how look. Somebody stand up and jump. I don't care. Do something. Don't sit there going. Come on. This is church. Amen. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Now we're going. Now we're going. We want to say seeing is believing. God says faith is believing even before we see. These priests, they were trusting and following God's directions. And when you do that, God demonstrates his power. Okay? So next in chapter 4, we're going to see God details his instructions. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 24, listen fast, okay? Because I won't try to read this fast. It's a bunch of, bunch of stuff. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people from each tribe and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the very place where the priests 
feet stood firmly and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. What? This doesn't even make sense, does it? Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. And this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall uh, be to all the people of Israel a memorial forever. I want y'all to go get some rocks for some souvenirs and put them out here, okay? And that way you can tell your kids about it. I mean, that's basically what he said. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and they laid them down there, and Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished. And the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to uh, all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh uh, passed over the ark. passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them, about 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, uh, just as they stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priest bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Cool. Neat miracle, right? The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they encamped at Gilgal. On the east border of Jericho, and those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall tell, let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. At flood stage, mind you. That was me adding that. God didn't say that. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God uh, did to the Red Sea. See, you remember the story about the Red Sea. So now you've experienced uh, pretty much the very same thing all over again. God is mighty in his power. Which dried up for us until we passed over so that all the peoples of the earth... Uh, may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. God details these instructions here. God says, hey, pick up, tw- uh, pick 12 men, have them pick up a stone from the river bed, and you need to notice that Joshua didn't say, what? Why in the world do we need 12 stones? What are you telling us to do here, God? And you need to notice that that Joshua didn't say that, and the 12 men didn't say, this is dumb. What do we need 12 rocks for? We can remember this stuff ourselves. All they did, they just simply obeyed the Lord. They obeyed God. God was preparing them to obey even if they don't understand, even if it doesn't make sense, even when things don't seem quite right, you still obey what God tells you to do. Here's another faith lesson. God often tells us to do things that we don't really understand. And our response should always be immediate obedience. Write it down. 
God tells us things that we don't understand. He tells us to do things we don't understand. And our response should always be immediate obedience. We should just obey God. We don't even need to know why. Usually it's because God's preparing us for an even bigger assignment to show us something even bigger and better. Back in the 1980s, a movie came out. Some of y'all remember it, The Karate Kid. Remember the movie? Daniel's son. Kid named Daniel goes to Mr. Miyagi, says, Mr. Miyagi, teach me karate. I keep getting beat up all the time. I need to know karate. Okay, Daniel's son. And he tells Daniel to go and uh, start painting a fence. First, you have to paint this fence. He says, no, you don't put it on like that. You go up and down, up and down. You have to paint it this way. So Daniel paints and paints and paints and paints and paints. Next thing you know, he tells him, all right, now you need to go wax my car. What? You remember, wax on, wax off, right? You remember that from the movie. Yeah, so, so he's telling him to wax his car and to paint the fence and do all these things. And the kid finally gets, you know, he's complaining the whole time, but he finally goes to Mr. Miyagi. He said, Mr. Miyagi, you're making me paint and wax. That's not what I signed up for. I wanted you to teach me karate. What he didn't realize was that Miyagi was teaching him proper technique for karate. He was building up the muscles that he needed to learn and do this type of karate that Miyagi knew. When God tells us to do simple, detailed things, you can be sure that he is teaching us obedience and he's teaching us the skills that we need to move on to the next assignment. Realize that. Sometimes you think, man, I'm doing meaningless work. Oh, it's not meaningless. It's not meaningless at all. He's getting you ready to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, constantly teaching you the skills that you need, building the faith muscles that you need in order to follow him. Somebody said, amen, I love it. That's right, that's right. So they crossed the river, they picked up the stones, they did what God said to do. Next, we're going to see God deploy his angelic army. Joshua 5, 10 through 12. I'll find it in a minute. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. This is really kind of cool. While they were in the desert, these guys have been eating manna for 40 years. By the way, the word manna means, what is it? No, the word manna means, what is it? The word of manna means, what is it? What is this stuff? It came down out of heaven, lands on the ground. We got to collect it early in the morning or it spoils and we got to eat it. What is this stuff? It's manna. Nobody knows what it is. It's just manna. But this is kind of a, a, a neat little deal, okay? For 40 years, they've been eating manna off the ground. And God says, now it's time for you to get off the spiritual bottle. It's time for you to eat from the produce of the land of Canaan that's flowing with milk and honey. There are a lot of Christians in our uh, world that are still on the bottle. They've been on the bottle for 40 years. They've been on the bottle for 60 years. They're little bitty baby Christians. And God said, it's time for you to grow up and get some spiritual meat. It's time for you to grow up in Christ. It's time for you to learn more and more and more about Jesus and get a hold of the deeper things of Christ. It's time, and I'll tell you right here, right now, it's time for us 
to get off the spiritual bottle and move on to the meat. This passage shows the growth that's taken place in the Israelites. This manna will sustain you. But God wants us to grow beyond that and move on to the spiritual truths and meat. Anyway, no more manna. And then something amazing happens. Look at verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. That reminds me of Moses. How about you? Remove your sandals from your feet, for you're standing on holy ground. Now, so far, Joshua thinks he's the general of the army, but now he runs into the commander of the Lord's army, who is this unnamed guy. Most scholars believe, and I think they're right, it is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. Okay? It's God. It's the pre-incarnate Christ. But that's another sermon in itself. We'll worry about that at another time. The point is God has his angelic army deployed and ready for battle. Here's another faith lesson. At any given moment, God has an angelic army ready to do battle on your behalf. Did you know that? There are angels all around us. They're real. Angels are real. Say what again? The faith lesson? At any given moment, God has an angelic army ready to do battle on your behalf. Part two. The only requirement is faith and obedience. Thank you for asking. Now, we like to think that we're pretty good with the faith aspect. Oh, I got faith. I believe that. But maybe we're not quite so good with the obedience part of it, right? We like to think that. But the truth is, you can't separate those two. You cannot separate faith and obedience. Without obedience, you don't have faith. Without faith, you can't have obedience. True faith requires obedience. How do I know? The Bible says so. Faith without works is dead. James 2, 17. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. When you fail to obey, you demonstrate your lack of faith. Where do you need God to send his angel armies in your life right now? You know. Then you better be trusting in faith and demonstrating that faith through your obedience. Because faith and obedience go hand in hand. Y'all ready to move on? Number four. God directed the battle. Joshua chapter 6. Now Jericho was shut up, beginning with verse 1. Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. 
Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So guess what they did? Faith and obedience. Jericho was the oldest, pretty much continually inhabited city in the ancient world. And it was also the most heavily fortified city in the ancient world at this time. It had a 30-foot wall all the way around it that was about four and a half feet thick. That's a big old wall. But here comes the Israelites. Here they come. Now, God's instructions seemed strange, did they not? Kind of like picking up 12 rocks out of the river, right? Strange instructions. It's even stranger than picking up 12 stones. For six days, march around the city one time a day. Just march around it. All right. So they did. On the seventh day, march around this city seven times. Then have the priests sound a long blast on their horn. And when the people hear that long blast, everyone shouts and the walls will come tumbling down. What a battle plan. Even the great General Patton and and General Schwarzkopf would have laughed at that plan. (laughs) That doesn't sound like much of a battle plan to me. But 1 Corinthians 12, 17, or uh, 127, I'm sorry. 127 says, but God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And don't forget Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, uh, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God's instructions were very strange, but uh, you got to notice that the people obeyed precisely. They did everything exactly as God commanded. They didn't skip a step, nor did they add steps. They simply executed God's plan as they were directed. They followed God's word. Do you want to see victory in your own life? Of course you do. The final faith lesson is this, to see the victory... You have to follow God's commands completely. You don't get to omit parts of it. You don't get to omit something if it seems strange or weird or dumb or odd or whatever. And you also don't get to add your own into it. You simply follow God in faith and obedience. Doing exactly what God says. People ask me for advice all the time. All the time. They tell me how their life's a mess. And I'm not talking about everyday problems like, you know, I had a flat tire or uh, uh, this happened or that happened or whatever. I, I mean, their life's a hot mess, okay? You're already thinking about someone that, that their life is a hot mess that you know. And I don't usually have to probe very deep to discover that the reason they don't have victory in their lives is because they claim to be a Christian, but they refuse to follow God's commands. Even the little things that they know they ought to be following. Hey, do you go to church? Well, (laughs) you'd be surprised how many people I run into that tell me they're a member here. I've never seen them anywhere else in my life. I've never seen them here, ever. Oh, yeah, we, 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 we go to the church up there, the, the Venus Bible Church. Really? Yeah, yeah. Do you go to church somewhere? Yeah, I'm the pastor there. Oh. <laughs> Happens all the time. Yet the Bible says not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. 
and they're forsaking it. No wonder your life's a hot mess. They claim to be Christians, but they refuse to follow God's command. Are, are, are you tithing? Do you give back to God? Well, no. Are you actively serving God anywhere? No. Are you involved in a ministry? No. Are you sharing your faith? Are you making disciples? The little things that God tells us to do that we don't obey and we wonder why our life is a hot mess? Simple. You're disobedient to God. So I want you to think about this for a second, okay? What commands, what instructions from God are you not following? That's probably why you're not experiencing victory right now. Like I said in the very beginning, Joshua didn't fight the battle of Jericho. God did. And God wants to fight your battles too. He does. But it requires something from you. Faith and obedience. What's your Jericho this morning? What is the obstacle standing in front of you? Unbelief walks around and it says, look how big my obstacle is. Look at my hot mess. Look how bad it is. Oh, what was me? That's unbelief. Faith and obedience say, look at how big my God is. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and Mackenzie and company will come and lead us in a song of response to God. And that's your cue to come. Okay? Do you want to see victory in your life? Then respond in faith and obedience. Of course, the first step to that is is to uh, have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you haven't trusted him as Savior and made him the Lord of your life, you come and I'll share with you exactly how to do that. You can begin a saving relationship with Christ today. Maybe you just want to come and pray and confess, God, I haven't been obeying you. Repent. Turn away from that sin and turn back to God. Hey, you come. Come and pray. The altar's open. Maybe God's telling you to do something right now. Respond in faith and obedience. Maybe he's telling you to join the church. Join this fellowship of believers. Uh, Maybe he's telling you to forgive that person that hurt you. Maybe he's telling you to pray for that person that you know is going through a really hard time right now. Hey, don't wait. Whatever God is telling you to do, don't wait. Respond to him now in faith and obedience. I'm going to pray. The worship team is going to begin the music, and you obey, because God wants to fight for you. Father, as we we wind down this morning, God, I mean, this is kind of really not winding down. This is kind of the centerpiece of all that's happened here this morning. The centerpiece is how we respond to you. It's not about us. It's about you, God. And, and, and God, I pray, God, that we would respond to you in a way that is pleasing to you, in a way that magnifies Christ. There are a lot of people with a lot of problems standing in front of me. And God, I pray that you give them the courage to believe you and respond to you in faith and in obedience. Work in us now. And help us, God, to see the victory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to stand and sing.